Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, Peace Watch and Pacifica Radio. My name is Verna Avery Brown. I am the Washington Bureau Chief for Pacifica Radio. I am also the executive producer of a program that no longer airs on Pacifica called Peace Watch, but also the executive producer of a program that does air called What's at Stake, Election 2004. Okay, and uh, going back to the buildup to the, the war in Iraq, can you kind of uh, give me a sense of what the mainstream corporate press was covering versus what you were covering here at Pacifica? Hmm. Well, um, I would have to say, in my opinion, for the most part, the electronic mainstream media was missing in action with regards to the, the anti-war protests and movements. Uh, there was a, a, a growing, a very vigorous anti-war movement just burgeoning across not only this country, but across the world, that the electronic media failed to, to show up and cover. We've been covering uh, anti-war rallies since April of 2002, prior to the invasion of Iraq. Once the organizations, the anti-war organizations, started hearing the drumbeat for war from the Bush administration, they began to organize and hold rallies and marches. And Pacifica was there on the front lines. And oftentimes, we were the only um, media there. Perhaps there were print reporters from time to time. But in terms of banks of television cameras uh, or, or having to jockey for space, with other radio uh, media op outlets, there was nothing like that. It was, it was really the most shocking thing that I had ever experienced in my 18-plus uh, year as a journalist. I couldn't imagine why they weren't showing up for these mass rallies and protests. You had, in some instances, hundreds of thousands of Americans braving bitter cold temperatures in some instances, heat in other instances, to be out there simply to send a message to the Bush administration that they did not think it was appropriate to invade Iraq, particularly without the backing of the United Nations. And the TV cameras weren't there. We would, we would go to these rallies. We'd see all these people, the organizers themselves, they would think, surely this time there'll be enough to warrant uh, coverage by the mainstream media. Hundreds of thousands would show up, no TV cameras. It was just, it was simply, I mean, you would think they would have shown up for the, the sheer picture of the event. One rally here in Washington actually had protesters that formed a chain around the White House, which of course is several blocks. And in order to have that many people forming a, a chain, you know, a hand holding around the White House, you've got, how many thousands of people do you think that is going to take? But, and I was just waiting for the aerial shot from the helicopter on the six o'clock news that night. Nothing, nothing whatsoever. So, I mean, in terms of what they were covering, they weren't covering the anti-war movement. After the war, and, and these, these rallies and organizations took place. Uh, you know, if, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I mm -hmm. didn't want to get too much. Um, this one? Do, do the male focus. Oh, yeah, one second. Okay, go ahead. Mm. These um, rallies and marches took place for the year prior to the invasion. On the day of the invasion, the day after the invasion, there were about 300 cities around this country that were holding protests. And I mean, these were, these were average citizens. These were, were um, people of religious and spiritual backgrounds. These were poets. These were military families uh, against the war. These were some politicians, uh, some in the, um, the Congressional Black Caucus opposed the war, others as well in the Progressive Caucus opposed the war. You had the U.S. clerics that were questioning the preemptive strikes. There were anti-war movements all around this world, around the globe, and the mainstream media oftentimes refused to, 
A, show up to cover the domestic protests, but they, they were a little bit more inclined to show the protests from around the world. For example, on CNN, you would see where there were protests in, in England and France and Spain, but you wouldn't see anything about the 100,000 that turned out in New York City, right under their noses. You know, and, and so, you know, there was a deliberate attempt to just completely ignore that there was a major anti-war movement in this country. I remember speaking with um, some of my um, former colleagues, former uh, college colleagues, actually, at an uh, event here in Washington. I was, a, I was a student of American University, and that's where I got my degree in communication, and this was an opportunity for a lot of us to come back what, some 30 years later, um, 20 years later, so I don't know, I'll give you the numbers later, we'll do the math, but, um, and, and many of my colleagues had gone into mainstream media and they were holding a discussion. And, and so at the question and answer period, I asked, well, how is it that so many of you opted not to cover the anti-war movement? And what they said, one of them said to me, well, Bush had pretty much already made up his mind that, you know, he was going to invade. And so that was a reason not to cover it. As a journalist, I was just appalled. I, I couldn't understand. And then you have to think back to um, situations. Um, uh, for example, what, what happens in these newsrooms, what Phil Donahue, you may recall, was actually um, fired the month, February 2003 the month before the war began um, because they felt, and I'm going to read from a book from one of my esteemed colleagues, Amy Goodman, The Exception to the Rulers, where they said that Phil Donahue was actually fired because he, was, um, he would have come across as too liberal um, and, and it would have provided them an opportunity for liberalism while their competitors uh, would be, you know, engaged in flag-waving activities. So this network decided that it was just far too risky to have liberal dialogue on the shows. And I mean, if you, if you think back and think in terms of the way the network's covered, you would always see, you know, a whole um, steady stream of, of generals or Air Force or, or Navy or Army, you know, military officials speaking about the war. Um, and they were almost all speaking in lockstep, you know, they were just everything they were, you could just go from one channel to the other and you would hear basically the same thing coming out of a different uniformed figure's mouth. Uh, how often did you ever hear the protesters or the organizers of the anti-war movement? you know, sitting at one of these anchor desks, uh, articulating their reasons for opposing a preemptive strike. A preemptive strike, what is that? Isn't, uh, you know, why wasn't there far more journalism put into um, preemptive strike, this policy? In other words, we're going to attack you because at some point you may decide to attack us because we think you have weapons of mass destruction. It sounds like it's illegal on the face of it to me, but there should have been vigorous reporting around this policy. People around the world were saying that the U.S. you know, needed to seek the backing of the U.N. When Nelson Mandela spoke out against the war, this man is a, a revered one of the most revered and honored statesmen of our time. He had to ba basically come out of retirement and make a statement about this war. He said the United States policies are a threat to world peace. I mean, it was just, it, it's unbelievable that the, 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 nat the uh, main networks refused to cover this war in a more um, partisan or, or, you know, objective manner. But when you think about the fact that the mainstream media is basically owned by six huge corporations, then you start to connect the dots and things start to make a little bit more sense. You know, ABC and Disney, ABC owns Disney, um, 
Viacom is owned by CBS. They also own MTV, Nickelodeon, Paramount Pictures, um, Time Warner owns AOL, CNN, Warner Brothers, Time, and 130 magazines. Fox, Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, owns HarperCollins, The New York Post, DirecTV, and 34 TV stations. I mean, that is power. That is control. That is monopoly. It's mega monopoly. Uh, and there used to be, and then CBS owns Westinghouse, and, and NBC owns, is owned by, I'm sorry, Westinghouse owns CBS, and General Electric owns NBC, which means they also own MSNBC and CNBC. So it's no wonder that you have, you know, this military, pro-military position being taken. And as has been said, you know, the sins are from the omission of the coverage, what's being left out of the coverage. So, you know, when you have something like Westinghouse, a corporation like Westinghouse or General Electric, which are major nuclear weapons manufacturers, two of the major nuclear weapons manufacturers in this country, owning two of the major networks, then it's, it's not hard, you know, the picture starts to really come into focus as to what's happening here. So, and, and from your, from Pacifica's standpoint, uh, talk a little bit about how you're able to go beyond the corporate ownership and a lot of the, you, you're, you have a different revenue model of how you get money and talk about, you know, viewer supported radio and how that changed your perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, um, of course, Pacifica has a 53, 54 year history of being listener supported. So we don't take money from corporations. Therefore, we're not beholden to corporations. Our uh, initial mission, dating back to Lou Hill, who was the founder and the creator of Pacifica, um, was to cover issues of uh, social justice and civil rights and um, you know human rights. He was an anti-war uh, protester himself. So these are, are obvious, you know, a war is an issue that Pacifica is naturally going to cover. Um, at the same time, we attempt, in the Washington Bureau, we attempt to try and show balance. But after a while, it gets to be pretty silly for us to be trying to show balance or present balance in our coverage when there's such a preponderance of um, drumbeat towards the war. It's almost as if the mainstream media had become a propaganda um, arm for the Bush administration. You, you have anchors, mainstream anchors, putting on helmets and becoming embedded reporters. How is a reporter going to be objective if he's right there in the tank alongside the soldiers? I mean, come on. It's absurd on the face of it. We call them in bed it, journalists, I in, in bed with, not embedded. So Pacifica has, of course, covered these issues from, from day one, from, the, from its inception. Um, and of course, we were there on the front lines to cover, to cover this um, invasion of Iraq, this illegal invasion of Iraq, the continued occupation of Iraq. And we will continue to cover even the events following the so-called transfer of power back to the Iraqi people. When I talked to uh, Jay Rosen of uh, NYU Journalism Chairman, um, he basically said that whenever you have an event that has a very high passion, that they, almost a sort of a fundamentalist type of perspective, a lot of passion and emotion that the journalists will tend to covered as a photo op and not really as a uh, what they're actually saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, speak to, do you see that, you know, in, in from the anti-war movement's perspective, you know, how can they become part of the debate more? It seems like there wasn't a very effective job if, if there needs to be changes, does there need to be changes on both ends, in other words? Does the anti-war movement need to try to enter into the debate more? 
Oh, are you saying do they need to tone down their enthusiasm or their uh, disgust well, for the Bush administration's foreign policies in order to be allowed into the debate or the discussion? I, is I, that the question? Well, I guess, I mean, another way to frame it in a way is if you look at the platform that International Answer put forth, there was a lot of ex, you know, extra topics that went way beyond the scope of the issue. And when, as a journalist covering mm -hmm. Iraq, there may have not been a lot of pertinent stuff to cover if you were just covering the speeches. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it goes beyond that, but I think there's there can be criticisms on both ends. So in, in hindsight, when you're looking at the anti-war movement, what mm -hmm. would you change? I wouldn't change a thing since I am not a part of... Okay. Uh, okay. I'm, and I'm not, my, I'm not going to be including my... Oh, okay. Portion, so. oh, okay. Um, I wouldn't necessarily change anything that the anti-war movement is doing or not doing. I think the uh, responsibility is incumbent upon the journalists to go there to find the story, even if it's a nugget, you know, a tiny nugget within a lot of other stuff that they just have to weed through and say, well, this is irrelevant, this is not pertinent, you know. But I think that's a journalist's job, unless you're accustomed to just being handed a press release or showing up at a press briefing and being spoon-fed what your story is supposed to be for the day. Um, if there's uh, a lot of emotion and not enough substance, that's the journalist's job. That's the reporter's job. Find the substance. You know, uh, interview the people that will support or or refute the claims that are being made. Uh, I wouldn't dare to suggest that the the movement do anything differently. Um, not one thing at all. The journal it's, it's incumbent upon the journalists. To, to, f to frame, find the story, report the story, and then uh, present it. So when you look at, you know, there are a lot of failures in the three institutions, the government, or the, you know, the White House, the Congress, well, uh, government in a way, media informing society, and you have all three of those to some extent are, you know, it, can you talk a little bit about the government, co Congress's role in the build-up to war and how they, may have failed as well. And, and, and a lot of journalists I talk to, it's like, if there's no debate within Congress, they can't cover it. But then if the Congress also says at the same time that they, they don't see the press covering it, so they don't go on, on the edge, so it's kind of a mm -hmm. loop. But can you talk a little bit also about the Congress's role? There? Well, um, it was our opinion uh, at Peace Watch and Pacifica uh, that many of the congressmen and women abdicated their authority and their responsibility in terms of giving the Bush administration authority to go to war. Um, so if they're not having debate about that, it's in, again, where is the reporter nagging uh, the, the senators, the representatives, why are you doing this? You know, raising those questions at the, um, at the press conferences, dogging them. There's sort of a, a, a pack mentality among journalists, particularly in Washington, D.C., because, you know, they want to fit in. You know, I've been on Capitol Hill. You, you ask, uh, you know, a question that uh, is, is an impolite, too probing question, you know, and everybody turns and looks to see who asked that question, you know. And, and they say, oh, it's Pacifica, you know, someone from Pacifica, as though they're expected to ask off the wall, you know, uh, outrageous, you know, radical questions of that nature, you see. And so then a lot of the journalists, because they want to, you know, they cover that beat daily. And I, I don't know, I guess they just don't want to um, be subject to, to being outside of the club, you know, so to speak. I don't know, maybe that's unfair. The question would be better asked to them. Why weren't those hard questions asked, those impolite questions, those uncomfortable questions, the ones that, you know, prick the consciousness of the politicians? Sure, if the politicians are not doing their job, but also are the journalists doing their jobs as well? So there's, there's enough room to go, you know, there's enough room for finger pointing to go around on both sides. And I, I mean, I've heard also reports where a constituent mail on this issue was overwhelmingly against the war, and then they went, do you have a sense of, uh, any reporting that you've done of, of actually how much the quantity of, of dissent that the congressmen were receiving versus how much, you know, did they ignore a lot of it, in other words? Not right off the, the top of my head. Um, 
We did cover a number of instances where uh, constituents were sitting in in the offices of their representatives. Um, in the office of, uh, there was one case where one woman um, actually did a prolonged presence in the office of, of her congressman. Um, and he was, you know, quite uncomfortable with her being there, but uh, nonetheless, these are the type of, you know, there were cases where students would come and they would confront their congresspeople, and the congresspeople would go ahead and vote, as you well know, the vote for the war, you know, was, there was only one congressperson that voted against giving Bush the authority, and it was California, U.S. Representative Barbara Lee from California. The one, um... That was for Afghanistan, though. For the Iraq War, that was in October, right? There was a lot of... After, of, after the um, September 11th. Right, but in my film, I'm, my time period that I'm looking at in particular is uh, specifically Iraq. So, mm -hmm. so there was... Uh, the vote in October, I think, was, was fairly... There was a lot of dissent, but not enough. But... Okay, I'm talking about when Barbara Lee, right. after September 11th, the um, vote to invade... And I believe that was Afghanistan, because in, in October mm -hmm. 10th and 11th, there was a lot of, there wasn't, there was a number of congressmen, I mean, no, my, my, Elijah Cummings, I know, mm -hmm. voted against it, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, and it, going back to the objectivity in, in Pacifica, in a way, there seems, from my perspective, uh, from the mainstream media, they have this, he said, she said. So in a way, they're only covering topics from two points of view, what the Democrats and Republicans are saying and anything outside of that isn't being covered. Can you speak to that and, and whether or not you, you see that as a constraining factor for how the mainstream journalists are, are covering it and in, in the role of Pacifica of kind of picking up the slack? I'm not sure I understand exactly what your question is. You mean within the context of the war, he said, she said? Well, uh, the objectivity standard is usually to get both points of view. Mm -hmm for and against, but in some topics such as Iraq, there may be 20 points of view. And so they may only be covering a liberal hawk who wants to go to war versus the conservative hawk who wants to go to war, so there's no debate. Mm -hmm. Well, what I found was missing uh, from, from the debate was clearly the voice of the people and the voice of the anti-war movement. It wasn't invited into the dialogue at all, or well, rarely, you know, if ever. Uh, it was as though it didn't exist in this country. I mean, you had prominent people speaking out, many of whom could have been invited to, uh, particul to, to articulate these anti-war positions. You had um, people like the former president of the Pacific Stock Exchange, Warren Langley, was a protester. He actually stopped traffic in Berkeley um, during an anti-war protest. Why wasn't, you know, he was a U.S. Air Force lieutenant colonel who served in the military for 15 years. Why did, you know, where's the creativity? Why wasn't he invited to be a part of the dialogue? You know, if colonels and generals are who you want to get perspective from. Um, Danny Glover, an actor, also an activist with Trans Africa, you know, he, he was a major anti-war opponent. Why wasn't somebody like Desmond Tutu appeared at an anti-war rally in New York. Ossie Davis. I mean, these are people that are, are um, esteemed, respected individuals in their own rights and, you know, should have been recognized and invited into the dialogue. Their perspective should have been included. They were not. They were ignored. Uh, even the president's own um, uh, religious leader spoke out against the war. And apparently, it didn't make much difference to him, to the president. Can you talk? I know you've uh, you've interviewed Scott Ritter a number of times. Can you talk about you know giving voice to other skeptics like uh, such as Scott Ritter and some of his insights um, or at least there were segments that were aired on Peace Watch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely Scott Ritter as as most people know was a former UN weapons inspector and he's uh, written a book and made statements about the fact that he felt there were no weapons of mass destruction 
And he's been saying this for, you know, now years, uh, but in the time frame leading up to the war. But the media and, and the print media, for one, any attention that they devoted to him tended to be negative. You know, they tried to paint him as someone who was um, an opportunist, you know, seeking press, and tried to discredit him as opposed to really um, just kind of considering and analyzing what he was saying and the work that he had done. And now here we see, years later, the, the war is so-called over. Scott Ritter and a lot of other people were right. They still have not found any weapons of mass destruction. And even that, why isn't the press making more of a, making a bigger deal out of that? They did not find weapons of mass destruction. President Bush um, went out of his way in that, that speech, that State of the Union address, to say that we know Saddam has weapons of mass destruction because he was, and, and they, they cited a deal between um, Niger, the African country of Niger, where Saddam had attempted to purchase uh, uranium, or yellow cake, as it's called, uh, which would be used towards making um, yeah, nuclear weapons. And it was known to be false. He had had several reports by uh, individuals in his own administration, including a former ambassador, Joe Wilson, uh, another a military uh, personnel, high-level military uh, person, and another individual had all done thorough reports and submitted it to the Bush administration saying this is an error, this is not accurate, we can't use this information. And so what the Bush administration then did was they put it in the State of the Union address anyway and cited a British white paper, knowing that the British white paper was actually based on the same sketchy evidence that his own administration had already investigated and dismissed as invalid. Okay. And um, one thing that I've noticed that mainstream journalists, both print and media, they cover issues day to day, whatever happens new, whatever new news happens. And Pacifica, I noticed that there, there seems to be covering issues, issues as, a, as opposed to the events. And can you talk to um, how the coverage differs in that way, if you're looking at over over a long periods of time instead of what's happening each day? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think that sort of harkens back to um, our Pacifica's early beginnings in radio. It was a very unique sort of experiment that Pacifica was doing uh, back in the early days of radio, whereby it deviated from the short news segments and actually explored during longer news segments and more in-depth sort of news segments, which was something you didn't hear on radio often. But because of those early days of lengthier in-depth coverage, we still have that sort of as part of our format. Um, our listeners tune in to Pacifica precisely because they know they're not going to just hear sound bites, you know, 30-second sound bites that you're going to get in the mainstream media. And uh, you're going to have analysts and experts and artists and poets and, you know, a more broad range of voices. We like to say that we give voice to the voiceless in society because oftentimes we have people on our airways that you're not going to hear on, uh, on the mainstream airways. You're not going to hear uh, Jason Halperin, who worked at a New York-based international human humanitarian aid organization. He was out having dinner with a friend going to the theater one night in New York, and the New York City Police Department raided the restaurant that he was in, and uh, they said they were conducting a routine raid under provisions of the Patriot Act. And uh, several officers identified themselves with the Homeland Security, and when Halperin and his companion were asked if, you know, if they could leave, they said, oh, no, you're not going anywhere. And the agents threatened that Halperin could be held up to a month before he could even contact his attorney if they chose to do that. And he was just astounded, and he happened to look into the kitchen of the restaurant and saw people crawling on the floor um, trying to, you know, escape the... the um, the Homeland Security Squad, and um, 
you know, from the back of the restaurant, followed by the agents. The agents had guns drawn and, and pointed at the workers, and they were cowering out of fear. Uh, so, I mean, this is an ordinary voice that you would hear on, you'd hear his story on Pacifica. I don't know, I didn't hear it on ABC, NBC, or CBS, did you? I mean, then there's a story of, um, uh, let, let's say, the senior citizens' protests that took place out at a, a home, a senior citizens, the Mill Valley's Redwood Retirement Center in Marin, California. Every Friday, these senior citizens would get out there in their wheelchairs and their walkers and their canes, and they protested the war. And there were over a hundred of them. You heard us talking to Eleanor Kennedy on Peace Watch. I don't think you heard or saw that story on, on the mainstream media. I could be wrong. I mean, there's a story of the two young women who wanted to put a protest sign up in their, um, in their window. And they lived in a small town, Jenny Klotz and, and Michael Simon. They lived in a rural community of Mondovia, Wisconsin. And uh, they told, there was a population of 2,500. And um, they put up a protest sign against the war in their window, in their apartment window, and they were practically run out of town. They had a very difficult time. I mean, uh, people would harass them, heckle them. Um, I think that in one instance, the, her job was even threatened. So, I mean, these are stories of average Americans that were protesting this war that you were not hearing any place else. When we would take our microphone to them, they were just so relieved that there was somebody that even cared that they were against the war. And then they could tune into Pacific and they could hear other people all around the country that were also, you know, protesting this illegal invasion of Iraq. I mean, and I, I could go on. I have well, a got, list. Uh, of, I've got other uh, specific mm -hmm. uh, questions. Kind of a, taking a step back and thinking in general terms, it seems that uh, both at Pacifica, they do try to incorporate those diverse and other skeptical viewpoints that are mainly ignored. And can you talk about the importance in, in kind of general terms of of, of why the mainstream media should should get a, a cross section of both class and race and different points of view. Why the mainstream media should? Well, because that's what America is okay, made sorry, up of. Uh, <laughs> just uh, I'm not going to have my question. Oh, okay. So it just needs to be um, explained. Well, uh, of course, the the mainstream media should, as Pacifica does, seek a cross section of. Um, of responses, a diversity of opinions, because this is America, and we are a diverse country. And to leave out the voices of, of uh, mothers, single mothers on welfare, whose kids, incidentally, may be lining up in uniforms being sent over to Iraq, to leave those voices out of the debate, you know, and only have white men in suits, you know, uh, ever being, they're, they're only the ones that have, you know, legitimate say. In, in what goes on in the policies, you know, is just really almost criminal, in my opinion. You know, where are the microphones lined up in the communities asking the young, the young uh, high school and college students that may, you know, be called on to serve the country, how they feel about the war? When was the last time we heard interviews like that? Uh, you know, leading up to that war. Um, you know, why not get the voices of the, the family members, not just the ones that, oh, say, you know, salute and hang the flag out and say, um, we love this country and, you know, support our troops. Why not the mothers and, and the families that are saying, you know, we really are skeptical about, you know, this war? Aren't, isn't the public entitled to hear both sides and make up their own mind about where they, you know, weigh in on the situation? I completely agree. <laughs> in a way, I just, you know, we talk to, uh, you know, liberal hawks and, and people who are for the war, and they just seem, you know, just so far removed from the realities of the decisions that they're making in their offices. And can you, there seems to be a lot of that mentality here within Washington and New York City. They're so far removed from reality.
even the journalists in a way. So can you kind of speak to, to, to like... I'm not sure it, I, know, I understand what you're saying. The, the seems, liberal hawks. Well, you know, like, for example, uh, Michael O'Hanlon, you know, someone who was supportive of the war and even uh, is still... The only his, his only regret on going to war is that we didn't have more of our friends to share the costs. You know, there seems to be no, you know, hindsight of, like, it was a bad idea, we shouldn't mm -hmm. have done it in the first place. It's, you know, these, these people who are sitting in, su in their suits in Washington making these decisions... Mm -hmm. You know, that in just kind of your viewpoint of that, that culture within Washington mm -hmm. where these people who are privileged or in power and have money and are sending these kids off to die. Mm -hmm. in a way. Well, you know, what I thought was, was, was striking was that I think there was only one member of Congress who actually had a child or, or you know, not a child, but a, a, a young man or woman, their child in the military. One member of Congress. Say that again. Yeah, just say that one more time. Just okay. To um, you know, it was really striking that only one member of Congress actually had a son or, you know, or daughter that was actually going to be in the military, that was in the military. So here you have all these um, mostly men and a few women, uh, privileged, elite, making the decisions to, yes, go into war, you know, invade Iraq, preemptive strike. Um, but none of them were willing, you know, none of them really had anything as precious as their own sons or daughters at stake. And in Michael Moore's movie, he actually did a skit where he goes up and asks them, you know, you, you want to get behind the troops? You want to get behind this war? Can we get your son? You know, can we get you to sign up for your son or your, or your daughter to go? And it was the most hilarious thing you've ever want to see. But, um, but it does bring the point home. Yeah, it's easy for them to make these decisions uh, in, in suites, you know, um, about other people's sons and daughters. And, um, and at the same time, they, they sort of shield themselves from hearing those voices and those opinions of the Americans that are going to be on the front lines. You know, why wasn't there more... Um, journalism done around the fact that President Bush was, per, was more than likely AWOL through his National Guard experience. It, it's been proven that, you know, now I think today we're hearing that the Pentagon says, oh, those records are, have been destroyed inadvertently. The President was AWOL during his National Guard duty. That's a major story. Could even be some legal implications behind that, for all I know. And, and going back to uh, building up to the, the war in Iraq, from your recollection, what were some of the the stories that Pacifica was was doing that that in your mind stick out as being like bi really big flags that there was something wrong with the case to, to going to war? Mm. Thank you. Well, the whole fact that there were people like Scott Ritter, the UN weapons inspector, who said that um, there were no weapons of mass destruction, the whole fact that the United Nations, you know, had to be browbeat by the Bush administration, you know, into um, to, to signing up on some very minimal basis of going to war against Iraq, the fact that practically every other country, every other main, uh, major country in the world was opposed to going to war with the exception of uh, England and even uh, Prime Minister Blair didn't have the full support, you know, of his government behind him and not nearly his people as well because there were major protests in the streets. Um, the whole um, alienation, how this administration had to alienate countries that had previously been our allies in order to just uh, ramrod this policy, you know, this hegemonic foreign policy through. Um, those were the first red flags. I mean, there were, there were so many along the way. Um, 
but but those I would say were the key the key reasons for me as to why uh, this war was illegal and just the whole idea of a preemptive strike. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, if we can now go around and attack anybody preemptively that we think might want to attack us, then where is social justice? I mean, where is, where does that leave peace? What is, what is the chance for peace in this world if we are allowed to do that? Uh, we, we are, as Nelson Mandela said, a threat to world peace. If we're going to take this preemptive strike policy and apply it wherever we see fit, with or without the sanctions or the, condone, the condoning of the major body, the United Nations, that was set up for just such instances like this. So, I mean, it, it was really, it was very disheartening. Um, it was scary. And it was, it was depressing. I, I have a, an American flag that um, was given to our family at my grandfather's funeral. He was a serviceman. We have actually two in our family. My husband's father was a, a, a military pilot. Those flags are still folded up in my closet where they're going to stay until I actually feel proud as an American to wave those flags again. The time has not yet come. To be honest, I'm not sure if I'll ever get a chance. I'm not real happy about where Carrie is going with this. Carrie and Edwards both supported the war. Carrie is even s suggesting that we send in more troops. I think somewhere between 20 and 40,000 more troops. I have four sons. I don't want to see any of them in a uniform headed for Iraq, particularly well, of course, now the, the occupation is supposedly over. But it's not. And the media is not even allowed to cover the bodies coming in from Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. I think it's actually illegal. It's against the law to do that. And you, you mentioned the, the browbeating of the UN. Can you kind of talk about Bush's attitude towards diplomacy and international law and you know, how, or, or lack of cooperation, or just from any patterns that you see that, to that point. Let's see. Well, the Bush administration, I think, has exhibited a, um, a form of arrogance and disregard for uh, the opinions of other national leaders, uh, with the exception of those that agree with him. France had been an ally of the U.S. Uh, for decades, and because they opposed him at the U.N., suddenly France and everything French, you know, is just, uh, it's like they're a pariah, you know. They wanted to stop serving French fries at the U.S. in the cafeteria at the Capitol. How absurd is that? You know, um, Nelson Mandela spoke out against the war, said that the U.S.'s policies were a threat to world peace. And Bush later snubbed Nelson Mandela at an event because of that, um, with the exception of Tony Blair, who has been, I guess, his twin on this issue um, from the very beginning, has supported him um, and continues to support him throughout. You know, uh, he's the only opinion that President Bush seems to respect. Uh, they um, ignored, well, I don't have any more to say on that, okay, really. That's fine. Uh -huh. um, and let's see. Um, How many more questions you got? I think that's, that's, uh, that's about it. That's about it. Let me see if mm -hmm. uh, any more questions about. Well, just I, I guess one tactic in a way that I saw that 
a lot of anti-war rallies were were, hold, were held during the weekend, which is mm -hmm. a lot of the audiences for television news or whatever is lower. So uh, did, do you see that that there needs to be like a, a switching of the timing or how, how how can you get in, how can you get these voices into the news cycle more you know the tactics or whatever mm. that, it, it just seems like it, it's a weekend event and then they move on hmm. well see I don't feel as though it's the responsibility of the um, the the anti-war movement to try and and stage their rallies when it's um, convenient for the networks um, you know, I don't personally think that's their job. I think their job is to to hold their rally in a time when they can turn out as many people as they possibly can. And it's the responsibility, the onus is on the networks to frame it as the major event that it is. When you have nearly a million people turning out in New York City in, you know, frigid cold temperatures, um, that's a major event and it hardly gets a mention on the, the network news. And at the same time, there seemed to have been some sort of conspiracy. And this is, you know, put me in the column of conspiracy theorists. But the New York police, you know, very begrudgingly granted the permits for the, the protesters, for the organizers of the marches. Uh, it's almost as though dissent has become criminalized. Uh, oh, here come those anti-war protesters. You know, let's find ways to really make their life miserable. We're, first of all, they're gonna corral you into little, you know, they're putting up these pins where they can only have so many, you can only have so many protesters at a time. What that does is it diminishes, you know, the picture. And even if TV cameras show up, they're gonna see a far smaller picture of who's there simply because they're corralled, you know, they bring the horses out. Um, that can be very intimidating if you're a protester just there to exercise your civil liberties. And you've got these, you know, police officers on these huge horses, which are, horses seem to be skittish among crowds anyway. You know, it's very intimidating. And then you've got, you know, rows and rows of um, officers with, with billy clubs and, you know, why is that necessary in America? How is it we got to that point? You know, so I, I don't see where the, the, um, the um, organizers need to do one thing differently. I think really the onus lies on the media to cover the event is basic. The final question I have is, why did the United States go to war in your sense? When you look at everything, like, what are the motivations for why we had a military intervention in Iraq? Well, I mean, there are so many different theories on that. Um, there is a, 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 a thought out, a well-planned project called the Century for the New America, the Project for the New American Century. Uh, which was written by what are called neocons around the Bush administration, where they have a whole plan and strategy for the, the restabilizing the Middle East, which puts the U.S. F and Israel front and center in control of that region. And many experts that we have spoken with on our airways have said that that is a strategic, that going to war against Iraq was a strategic part of that whole plan and that whole project. Um, and of course, uh, Iraq being one of the largest oil reserves in the world, um, and President Bush being a, having been a Texas oil man, um, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot to connect those dots um, with Halliburton and, um, you know, the Vice President Dick Cheney's connection to Halliburton and its connection to the war and the reconstructing of Iraq. I mean, I think the bottom line is money. Money, power, access, greed. That's where I would weigh in. And I can't really point to one specific um, uh, incident or, or fact that would 
would, would sort of uphold that, but I think if you look at the whole picture, there are enough indications and facts and evidence that really support that. Many a scholar, many an academic, many a, um, analysts have put together a number of books. I have a whole shelf of books in my office devoted to people's reaction to the Bush administration's um, policies leading up to Iraq.